Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. And today I'm going to do a rundown of Dice Throw. If you're unfamiliar with Dice Throne, it is a fantasy combat game in which different uh, fantasy characters are competing to take out the Mad King, or rather they're competing to fight him in combat, so he's pitting them against each other to find out who the ultimate warrior is. This is the Season 1 box that came with the first Kickstarter, the second key Kickstarter came with a battle chest, or you could buy all of the heroes in these individual one-off battle boxes. Dice Throne is for two to six players and can be played as a 1v1 dueling game, a 2v2 team game, a 3v3 team game, or a free-for-all game. And there are a number of other variants as well, including a King of the Hill mode and some small game tweaks that you can make. And I'll talk a bit more about those variants in brief at the end of this video. But Dice Throne probably takes about 30 minutes to 60 minutes to play a 1v1 game, but longer if you're playing with a lot more players. It's recommended that you play some dueling games or some smaller games first so that everyone can get the hang of it because if you're not on the ball then the game can really slow down. In the game each player will pick a character and those characters will fight in direct conflict. In the season one box set there are six heroes and in each of the season two battle boxes there are two heroes making a total of 14 heroes in the game. Plus there's just been a season three kickstarter which includes a cooperative adventure mode and some more heroes as well. All of the heroes from all of these boxes are cross compatible and can be played against each other. All the heroes also have a complexity rating that ranges from 1 for the Barbarian in the first season to 6 for the Artificer in the second season. The complexity rating does not necessarily mean that the hero is more or less powerful, it just means that they're less intuitive and probably require a bit more of an experienced player to figure out the best ways to use their abilities. Speaking of which, each hero has a unique and different flavor which is centered around a unique deck of cards and set of dice that comes with the heroes. Players will be using these cards to upgrade abilities that the heroes have and also play them to manipulate the dice. But the majority of the game is played during the dice phase where you will be chucking dice and then playing Yahtzee rules to re-roll some of those dice trying to achieve certain patterns and combinations in order to activate your hero's abilities. So, what I'll do is I'll show you the components for a hero from Season 1 next to the components for a hero from Season 2. I'll do a quick note on setup, and then we'll talk through how to play Dice Throne. As usual, all the sections are in the description below, so if you want to find something specific or just know it's covered in the video, you can check that out down there. Without further ado, I will set up two heroes. So, as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference in the arrangement for the heroes from the first season and the heroes from the second season. They created these nice game trays and these boards folded up inside with all of the components. So the second season heroes are a lot easier to set up. Now in the third Kickstarter that they've just run, you can acquire all of the season one heroes. And this box is a little hard to find at retail now, but you can acquire all of these heroes through their third Kickstarter campaign, which I believe is still open for late pledge at the time of posting of this video. And in that campaign, they have revised these components so that they match the Season 2 components, which are a little more intuitive and easier to set up. So, as you can see, I have now taken out all of the components from the different trays and everything like that. And you can see a Season 1 hero here, an example of a Season 2 hero here. Each hero has a main hero board, which contains all of their abilities and information. A hero leaflet like this, which has any additional rules that apply to that hero. And their custom dice as well on the bottom. Each character has a set of five custom dice, a health tracker, a command points tracker, and a deck of custom hero cards. Some characters may come with extra components, such as the Huntress who has a Tiger Companion dial, and characters will vary in the number of status effect tokens they have here as well. As you can see, our Gunslinger has many more status effect tokens than our Barbarian who only has three. Once each player has collected the components for their heroes, you're ready to set up the game and start play. So let me talk about setup. Setup will vary slightly depending on the number of players you have playing the game. In a 1v1, this is all you'll need. Once you've got all these pieces out, there's only three things you have to do. You've got to give your hero deck a shuffle and draw four cards at random from the top. Then you set your command points to 2 and your health to 50. 
Finally, what you can do if you like is stack your status effect tokens on your leaflets. This helps you keep track of them for easy access later on when your abilities trigger. Now that each player is set up, we're ready to begin the game. When the game starts, each player will roll a die and whoever has the highest number will become the first player. So in this case, it's the gunslinger. The objective of Dice Throne is to murder your opponent. The last person standing is the winner. Each hero has a health tracker here, which is used to track their hit points, and when that reaches zero, that hero is eliminated. If both heroes reach zero hit points at the same time, they're both eliminated in a draw. If there are more than two players, the same thing applies. A turn in Dice Throne consists of an upkeep step, an income step, and then a main phase where you play cards from your hand. Then that is followed by an, a, a dice rolling phase. In the dice rolling phase, we are rolling the dice and attempting to make attacks. Once we've determined what attack we're going to make, our opponent will have the option to roll defense. Once the defense roll is resolved, there'll be another main phase and then play is passed to the next player. In a 1v1, that would just be the other player, but in a game with more than one player, it goes clockwise around the table. Players have three different kinds of abilities on their player boards, but the most common ability are attacks, and these allow you to deal damage to your opponent. In order to do attacks, you will have to roll the dice symbols that match the symbols on the attacks. Players also have these green defensive abilities that they can use in defense against an opponent's attack. The defensive abilities are resolved as part of that dice rolling phase in the middle of a turn. Some players also have purple passive abilities which change the game rules in varying different ways. It's very important to get to know your game board early on in the game so you know what your hero is capable of and what they're good at doing. The Barbarian is very good at attacking and he also has this healing ability. All of these abilities are triggered by his dice rolls during the offensive dice phase. This green one here is his defensive ability and every hero has one like this. There's a shield in the bottom right corner here to indicate that this is the defensive ability. Each hero also has this ultimate ability down here which slightly changes the rules of an attack so we'll talk about that a bit later. You can see over here the gunslinger's updated season 2 board but it's essentially the same thing. You've got six attack abilities here, the ultimate ability along the bottom, and this green defensive ability on the right with the shield. The gunslinger also has this passive ability down here. Some heroes have these and some don't. A turn begins with an upkeep phase, and in an upkeep phase we resolve any status effects that have an effect during upkeep. All of the status effects are described on the character's leaflets here. There are a lot of status effects in Dice Throne, and you won't see them all in every game, so make sure you familiarize yourself with the effects that are in effect in the game you're playing, and communicate these to your opponent as well. There are two kinds of status effects. Positive effects that are like buffs, which go on your character board, and negative status effects that are penalties and debuffs which go on your opponent's character board. Some of these are resolved at specific trigger times, such as in the upkeep phase, others have a one-time effect and are then removed, and some are even persistent and ongoing until your opponent somehow manages to get rid of it. Different characters can get rid of status effects in different ways, and some status effects can be spent for a one-time effect when the owner wants to trigger it. For example, the gunslinger has this passive ability that gives them a reload token. We can take a reload token from their character leaflet here, and we'll place the status effect into the middle of their player board. This token can be spent at any time during an attack to add damage to that attack. This is its unique effect. This is very different to something like a knockdown effect, which is applied to the gunslinger's opponent and has a separate trigger window, which is resolved at a specific time. All of this information is here on the character leaflet, including the very important stack limit, which tells you how many of these tokens can be on a single character board at any given time. Some tokens, such as burn, cause a character to go on fire and take damage every time the upkeep phase comes around until they get rid of the burn token. But there are a lot of status effects in Dice Throne. I don't have time to go into all of them in this video, but just make sure you familiarize yourself with them before you start playing and make sure your opponent knows what's available to you as well. After you've resolved the upkeep phase, it's time for the income phase. Seeing as our gunslinger is going first, she'll actually skip this on her first turn, but Afterwards, every player will do this after they've resolved upkeep. And in the income phase, you gain one command point onto your command point dial, and you draw one card from the top of your deck. If you ever run out of cards, you just shuffle your discard pile 
and reset your deck. After the income phase has been resolved, it's time for the main phase. And there are three things that you can do in the main phase, and they're all to do with this hand of cards. There are two fundamental kinds of cards in this deck of cards. You've got these action cards here, and these upgrade cards here. Now, action cards come in three different types themselves, so we'll look at those in a bit. Upgrade cards are indicated by this arrow symbol here, and they're used to upgrade your hero's abilities on their hero board. The Season 2 cards are exactly the same, but they have character art. You can see the upgrade symbol right here on the top left. If you want to buy one of these cards, you'll have to pay CP points to play the card. And the cost is right here. Now, as you can see, I've got two level 2 abilities here, and if I want to pay 2 CP, then I can play this Crit Bash card down onto my ability here. It replaces that ability, which is now better. Furthermore, as you can see, this has actually unlocked a second ability at the bottom. So now there are two abilities to choose from instead of just one. It is possible to play a level 3 upgrade card directly onto your ability without having the level 2 card. Simply pay the CP cost and put it in the appropriate slot. If you have played the level 2 ability first, then you can subtract the CP cost from the level 3 ability. So instead of playing 3 CPs for Smack 3, if Smack 2 is already in play, I could take 2 away and I'd just pay 1 to go up to the level 3 version. Not all abilities have a level 3 version, and it depends on your character and the way that they're set up. It might be worth having a look through your deck beforehand to see what abilities you can upgrade and what they do. Not all ability cards are blue. Some are in different colors depending on what their ability type is. However, these ability upgrades are still noted by the blue upgrade arrow and this M clock here, which indicates they're played only in the main phase. And they're just played the same as attack upgrades or anything else. Ability cards are a main phase card, which you can tell from this M clock here and this M clock here, which matches the main phase symbol here on your turn order reminder. The other kind of card you'll find are these action cards, and they're indicated by these stars. There are three kinds of action cards. Blue ones that can only be played in the main phase, orange ones which can only be played during the roll phases, and red ones that can be played at any time. Blue ones can only ever be played on your turn because they can only be played in your main phase. Orange ones may be played in your roll phase or your opponent's roll phase, but you must make sure you read the card carefully to see when it is appropriate to play it. Once again, you've got little reminders up here of when the cards may be played and in what phases. This iconography exists on the Season 2 cards as well, just below the CP cost on the upper left. So I mentioned that there are three actions you can take in the main phase. The first being playing upgrade cards to your character board. And the second action you can take is playing the blue cards, main phase cards from your hand. And the third action you can take is selling the cards from your hand. So if you decide there's something that you don't really want, or is maybe not very effective in this particular fight, you discard it, and you gain one combat point. This process of selling cards and managing combat points is really important, because you'll often find that you don't quite have enough combat points, and managing your hand and your resources is an important strategic decision. You'll have to choose between upgrading your abilities in the hopes that you roll the symbols you need to activate your more powerful abilities later, and saving resources for these orange dice cards that allow you to manipulate the dice in order to activate the more powerful abilities that you want. So with that in mind, let's talk about the roll phase. There are three. The offensive roll phase, the targeting roll phase, and the defensive roll phase. In the targeting roll phase, you'll be choosing which opponent that you're going to hit with your attack that you've already rolled in the offensive roll phase. The targeting roll phase is only used in a game with more than two players. So in a 1v1, you'll skip this phase entirely. There are different rules for the targeting phase based on the number of players you have and whether they're organized into teams or it's a free-for-all. But typically what you'll do is you'll roll one of your dice, and based on the number that you've rolled, you'll have different options. Sometimes you can pick any opponent, sometimes it will allow opponent to pick for you, and sometimes it will force you to target someone on your right or left. I'll show you some of the rules for that at the end of this video. But let's get to the offensive roll phase, because this is the most exciting part of the game, and it's where the majority of the gameplay takes place. In the offensive roll phase, you'll roll all five of your character's unique custom dice. What you are seeking to do is activate the symbols on your character's abilities. 
As you can see here on our basic revolver ability, we've got a bunch of different bullet results. And the more bullets we get, the more damage we can deal. Over here on Bounty Hunter, we've got two bullets and two bullseyes. Down here on Take Cover, we've got two bullets and three dashes. Whatever distribution of symbols we get, we can only activate one ability a turn, so we must think carefully about what we want to do. We may not always have a choice for our ideal ability though, because we'll have to think about what we've rolled and what we're trying to achieve. After you've rolled for the first time, you can choose any number of the dice and roll them again. You can repeat this step one more time, and after you've rolled a number of dice three times, then the offensive roll phase is resolved, you choose an ability, and hopefully you'll have been able to activate the one you want. In addition to abilities that are activated by different symbols, every character has two abilities that activate off a small straight and a large straight. A small straight is four consecutive numbers, and a large straight is five. So if you have the large straight, you also always have the small straight. Each character also has this ultimate ability, which is always activated with five sixes. The ultimate ability has some special rules that we'll talk about in a minute. Our gunslinger has rolled two bullets, two dashes, and a bullseye. Now, they're not far off take cover, and this will give them an evasive status effect, which helps them avoid damage when they're being attacked. That's pretty good. It also deals five normal damage, which is indicated by this black sphere here and this DMG here. Note that these indicators are only on the Season 2 board. On the Season 1 boards, normal damage is just indicated by the DMG, I, by the DMG here. Rerolling these four dice to try and get more sixes is a very risky proposition, and this kind of risk management forms the core decision space you'll be having during the offensive roll step. Our gunslinger decides to play it safe and just reroll this one dice, hoping for a dash, which she achieves. She's now able to activate take cover. The first thing that happens is she gains an evasive status effect, and because this is a positive status effect, this cannot be prevented, unless her opponent has a card they want to play. Now that she's gained this effect, she deals five damage. At this point, she could spend any reload tokens she has to enhance that damage. Different damage types can be modified in different ways. There are five damage types in the game. There's basic damage, collateral damage, undefendable damage, pure damage, and ultimate damage. Ultimate damage refers specifically to the damage from your ultimate ability. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Undefendable damage is damage that bypasses your opponent's defense roll, but can still be prevented using status tokens like evasion, for example. Collateral damage is also undefendable damage that may have an effect on other players in the game. Pure damage is the same as undefendable damage again, but it cannot be enhanced with combat buffs like the reload status. The simplest way to think about it is that only normal damage is actually defendable with a defense ability. Every other damage type cannot be defended against with a defense ability. However, all damage type can be avoided with a status effect such as evasion, except for the ultimate damage. All damage except for pure damage and collateral damage are enhanceable with positive status effects. And only collateral damage has the effect to hit more than one target. In this case, we've just dealt normal damage though. And in a normal process, that means our opponent can have a defense roll. A reload can be spent at any time, but our opponent's defense roll can be applied to the full damage they suffer. What this means is that even if we spend a positive status effect to modify our damage after our opponent's defense roll, any positive effects of the defense roll can still be applied to the full damage coming at them, including any modifiers we spend before the entire roll phase is resolved. Our Barbarian's defense ability is roll three dice and heal two times hearts. In this case, our Barbarian has rolled one heart. And what that means is they're going to heal two damage. Because they're taking five damage from the take cover attack, this means they're only going to take three damage in total. Our Barbarian could play an orange dice modification card to try and improve their defense roll, but unfortunately they don't have any applicable cards. They could also at this time play any red cards that were applicable, but they don't have those either. They'd always have to have the command cost to pay for the card. Because they cannot prevent the remaining three damage, this is recorded on their hit points tracker here. Now that the defensive roll has been resolved, the roll phase is over, and it's back to the gunslinger to finish their second main phase. After the roll phase, you have another main phase when you can sell cards and play any blue cards from your hand. After the second main phase, there is a discard phase, and if you have more than six cards in hand, you must sell these cards for command points until you only have six in hand. You can sell more if you like, going down to as few cards as you want. At the end of the discard phase, 
then your turn is over and play passes to the next player. So let's talk about the ultimate ability. The ultimate ability is triggered by five sixes, and this is the same for every character. The ultimate ability has different effects. In this case, it's got inflict stun, deal 15 damage. Over here on the gunslinger, they gain evasion, they inflict bounty and knockdown, then deal 10 damage, and they can spend reloads to add damage and reroll the dice one time if they do. The main thing to remember about ultimate abilities is that they do ultimate damage. What this means is that the damage cannot be stopped in any way. Ultimate damage can be enhanced by the attacker, but the defender cannot spend status effects, they don't get a defense roll, and they can't do anything. They can't even play cards from their hand. The only thing you can do to try and stop a possible incoming ultimate attack is if your opponent has rolled five sixes in front of them. The only way for you to stop an incoming ultimate attack is if you can do something with your cards to prevent it before it triggers. So. In this case, our gunslinger is happy with their five sixes. Our barbarian plays twice as wild. This is a orange card that affects dice rolls that costs three combat points. This makes two dice wild. Normally you'd want to save this for your own attacks to try and get that ultimate ability off. But in this case, they can play it on the gunslinger to make two dice wild and the barbarian can pick the faces. In this case, he changes both faces to something useless and he prevents the ultimate attack. After he'd played that card, it would go back to the gunslinger who could play her own cards to maybe affect the dice and try and restore the ultimate attack. But if the ultimate attack is triggered, then the effects are carried out. If you're playing with more than two players, you would have a targeting phase to find out who the ultimate attack hit. So that pretty much wraps up the gameplay section for Dice Throne. There's just a few quick notes here at the end. The first is card play priority. If a player has rolled a result that they want to keep, then we go clockwise around the table from that player, asking players whether they want to affect the roll. If the Barbarian passes, in this game of two players, then the attack is triggered. But if there were a second player, let's say it's the Monk, and the Monk decides to affect the dice roll, perhaps he changes a die face, then play would go back to the Gunslinger to make another effect. If she could, say, restore the ultimate attack, play might go back to the Barbarian again, and it will continue. The only time this priority chain stops is when everyone has accepted the dice roll and don't want to play any cards. It may be that the playing of a card will then trigger another effect. Perhaps a player wants to use a status effect or play a card from their hand, which is fine. Priority typically goes back to the active player, whose turn it is, to make a decision first. There are a few key words as well to keep in mind when resolving things in this game. Now, it should be noted that one key word is the key word then, and this has changed slightly in between the rules for Season 1 and Season 2. The then keyword just acts as a trigger window before the second part of an attack or ability is triggered. So, in this instance, the Bounty Hunter ability would inflict the bounty status effect and then the target would have an opportunity to play a card or one of their own status effects to remove the bounty status effect before the one undefendable damage is triggered. This damage would gain a bonus from the bounty status effect, so if the bounty status effect can be removed during this trigger window here, then it won't apply to the damage being dealt subsequently. Another keyword or symbol is multiply, which we see here. Of course, what this multiplier means is that when you roll for defense, you just take the number of heart symbols rolled on the die and multiply that by two and prevent that much damage. It is possible to overheal on defense with the Barbarian, so you come away with a net gain, although it's unlikely. Of course, the keyword or is pretty self-explanatory. It just means pick one thing or the other. And finally, the keyword steal. When the keyword steal comes into effect, for example, we'll say the Gunslinger has stolen five hit points from the Barbarian, and we simply reduce their, their appropriate level, and then add it over here. Just a quick note on hit points, you can never gain more than 10 above your maximum level. So if you started the game with 50, you'll never be able to go above 60. So you now definitely know enough to play Dice Throne 1v1, so I'll just give you a quick note on how it works with the targeting phase with multiple players. So in a 2v2 game, for example, during the targeting phase, you would roll one die, and on a one or a two, it would be your opponent on the left, three or four, an opponent on the right. On a five, your opponents choose which of them you hit, and on a six, you can choose. 
In a free-for-all mode, you can see that there are a number of changes. Specifically, players start with less health, and depending on your number of players, the distribution of the targeting dice changes. So that's pretty much it for me on Dice Throne. One thing I will say before signing off is that there are a lot of game variants, such as King of the Hill, and one game variant I particularly like is when you would take this deck and you create two separate decks, one for all the action cards and one for all the upgrade cards. When a player draws a card in their income phase, they can choose which of the two decks they want to draw from. And I particularly like this variant because it gives you a strategic decision to make in the income step, and it helps to mitigate some of the random elements of this deck of cards. But I hope you're excited to play Dice Throne. Michael and I will be back tomorrow to play and sass each other as we do the Barbarian versus the Gunslinger. So I hope you'll come and join us for that, and thank you very much for watching. Bye!